Well, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to uh, St. Norbert College and to the CEO Breakfast and Strategy Series. Uh, I'm Tom Kunkel, president of the college. And along with our sponsors, I'm so pleased that you could join us this morning. For 18 years now, the CEO Series has been providing area executives with the opportunity to hear from some of our top area CIOs. This resource is being brought to you through the generosity of our presenting sponsor, WPS, Health Insurance Arise Health Plan. The title sponsors for the series are Whipley, Imaginasium, Insight Publications, Johnson Bank, Johnson Insurance, and the sponsor of today's session, Bank Mutual. Please take the folders at your place with you and, and take a little time to review that information later if you would, we'd appreciate it. At this time, I'd like to ask my friend and colleague, Dr. Uh, Father Sal Kushia, Senior Director of Pastoral Services to offer a word of grace. Sal? Loving God, all good things are of your making. You call us together and provide nourishment for us. As we share these gifts of creation, fill us with the spirit of thanksgiving and make us aware of your constant presence in our lives. May this food give us strength of mind and body, so that by word and example, we may do your work more effectively. We ask this in all things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Sal. Enjoy your breakfast, and we'll be back with our program in a little bit. Well, I hope you enjoyed your breakfast. I know you're going to enjoy uh, our speaker, um, Kurt Brinkus, uh, you know, Kurt represents the, you know, essentially, you know, the leading edge, I think, of the new economy and, and um, is somebody um, that is, you know, working in an area in the, in the kind of company that we all realize is the next generation of economic development and, uh, and one of the solutions to some of the in more intractable problems that we have in the economy and it all started right here uh, in Greater Green Bay. So it's very, very exciting to have him uh, with us. Kurt is a, a founder and is the current CEO of Aver Informatics, which is a fast-growing company that uses data management and data analytics, uh, these tools, to try to bring uh, efficiencies to the healthcare industry. As I said, Aver began right here in our backyard, uh, literally in a garage, or a living room or a spare bedroom, and Kurt will tell us that, in 2010. And it is a classic American entrepreneurial story uh, started by Kurt and his partner, Matt Froliger. Um, both of them uh, were students here at St. Norbert College, and Matt actually is the son of uh, Dr. John Froliger, who is a faculty member here. And uh, it's, just, it's, it's a remarkable story that I know you're going to enjoy. As founder and CEO, Kurt is responsible for the vision, strategic business development, and customer and investor relations at Aver, along with all business operations. He has the privilege to lead a collection of creative Midwesterners, lots of us, right? Yeah, there are lots of us creative Midwesterners who are working to position the business as a positive force that creates sustainable change in healthcare. Kurt is a former CIO for a boutique claims auditing organization where he developed a team to create a claim audit technology solution. Prior to that, he was chief of staff for global and domestic provider service operations at United Health Group. He attended St. Norbert College and DePaul University, and he studied for a degree in continental and anal analytic philosophy, which I'm sure he's going to explain to all of us. Not only is he actively engaged in, exe in executing Aver's business strategy, but he also works with industry leaders to help transform healthcare. Please welcome Kurt Brinkus. Kurt. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Um, let's start a little timer to make sure I stay somewhat on time. I gotta grab this little clicker. So I guess uh, really the first thing, um, um, if you'll notice the title, um, you know, having attended a Catholic college, I wanted to see how far I could push the boundary <laughs> uh, 
and they actually put it in print. Like, if you look at the thing, they put the word hell in print. It was amazing. I was so excited uh, to do that. I thought they were going to come back. So, so anyway, um, that was really just to, to, uh, some link bait uh, to, to get people to come. So thank you all for coming uh, this morning. Um, we're going to talk about um, scaling Agile uh, across the company. So um, one of the things I want to do is I'll talk a little bit about a little bit about me and a little bit about the company, but I really want, actually want to spend time on, on this topic. This is something that I've become uh, pretty uh, passionate about. And it doesn't have to do necessarily with the core business, but my hope is that um, you guys as business leaders might look at this and, and say, hey, this is actually something kind of cool and I might want to try and implement uh, some of these things um, when you go back home today. So, um, so I guess a, a little bit about me, um, Green Bay native. Um, I attended St. Norbert College. I am <clears throat> eight credits shy of a degree. Um, <laughs> I actually got all of the stuff done for the philosophy degree. I was taking weightlifting uh, at, the, at the end, and I got recruited over to United Healthcare, and I was like, well, you know, I'll take the, the executive position at United Healthcare. Um, so maybe that's something that you guys can help me out with someday. <laughs> We should probably take care of that because I'd really like to donate. Um, so, <laughs> you'll take equity. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. Oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, so, uh, three kids, one wife. Um, you can ask me afterwards about what my epic pass was, um, but I feel like my whole life has been an epic pass. Um, um, so, as was mentioned, I was a chief of staff for global and domestic provider operations at United at um, a ridiculously young age and um, was totally underqualified for the job, but they let me do it. Um, was a chief information officer for another company and then um, I founded and, and started Aver. So, what is Aver? Aver, um, uh, and I could spend a half an hour talking about this, but we are building what we call a bundled payment network. And so, what we're doing is we're fundamentally transforming healthcare. Uh, so that we uh, package all sorts of services together for a single price and pay for it instantly. So all of you have received uh, things in the mail that say, this is not a bill, right? <laughs> and you're like, I think eventually it's going to turn into a bill, but I'm not quite sure yet. So um, what we do is we take something like pregnancy, which is generally nine months worth of stuff, and we package it all together for a single price. We do that for hip replacements, you know, heart attacks, you know, all sorts of different procedures. So. Um, that's what we're doing. And this is just kind of a macroeconomic view of what's happening. Um, starting at the birth of the ACA in 2010, or Obamacare, as a lot of people know it, um, there was this massive shift away from what's called fee-for-service, so doctors doing a particular service um, and um, getting a fee for doing that. And if you think about it, there's a perverse incentive there because I do more services, I get more fees. Um, and that's why we have the most expensive healthcare system uh, in America. Today we spend $3.8 trillion annually on healthcare, um, which is 17 or 18 percent of the GDP. Um, other industrialized nations spend about 5% of GDP. Um, so anyway, um, we're shifting towards uh, value-based reimbursement, which again, a bundle payment is one of those mechanisms. And um, if you really look at what's happening, um, this kind of concept of a bundle payment uh, has been you know, said that it's going to be between 50% to 30%. Either way, we're talking about trillions of dollars. It's a massive once-in-a-lifetime shift. Uh, of something going on. So that's what we're in the business of. And what we've done is we've created this uh, piece of software that takes all of these crazy fee-for-service things and, and packages it together into this single price and we get rid of all of the variation on price. So on a typical, uh, actually we just did an analysis um, up here in Northeast Wisconsin for a hospital system. For a knee replacement, it ranged anywhere from $14,000 to $168,000 for a knee replacement. And that's the crazy inefficiency. And the thing about the $168,000 knee replacement is that there is um, um, literally no complications. It all had to do with billing practices. Um, and I'd love to call out the, the hospital system that's doing it, um, so you guys should avoid them. Um, but you can ask me afterwards. Um, and um, uh, and uh, so anyway, we've built up this piece of software. We are the uh, largest piece of software um, uh, servicing Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, all these, you know, massive health plans across the country uh, in the commercial and Medicaid space. So that's a little bit about AFR. Giving you that as a little bit of context to say, what is this problem that I was trying to solve? So the problem was, is that last year we grew 400 um, percent. And anyone that's ever gone through a growth like that, it hurts. 
it hurts really, really bad. <laughs> um, there's a lot of stuff that happens. And so what it exposed is um, what we call debt. Um, and so we, we think about things in, in the terms of technical debt and process debt and product debt. Um, technical debt, things like when we got our first billion rows of data from Aetna, um, it crashed the system. <laughs> so it still limped along, right? But there was all sorts of things that we realized that we had to do to improve that. So there's technical debt. Process debt, when you go from eight people in Green Bay, Wisconsin, to grow to 55 people in a period of six months, and you have all these new faces and all these new things, so you have to have processes that you need to put in place uh, to be able to handle that. And then product debt is just kind of the perceived thing. And um, the thing is, is that we had to figure it out or die trying, right? So we have pressures from the top. So so all of our competitors are billion dollar um, healthcare corporations and then we have um, competition coming from the bottom um, for startup companies that are now starting to look at this opportunity and um, venture capital with lots of dollars being thrown behind it. So I think anyone in this room can probably identify with this. Um, business operations are messy. Um, that we typically organize people by um, skill. So like you would have a department of salespeople and a department of analysts and you'd have a department of uh, you know, customer service people and you'd have executive team. And so we, we organize people by skill. Um, and as a request comes in, what happens is a request will ping around a company and go from skill to skill until you know, something gets happened, um, um, until the entire deliverable is done. And so the problem is, is that every time that you pass over a deliverable, that handoff creates a potential point of failure. Um, and I'm sure all of you have stories about, well, I thought Sally was doing that, or I thought Joe was doing that, or you have to have these project managers that you know, kind of shuffle things from, from one place to another, and it becomes very complicated. So um, there's all this inconsistency between these groups, and, and then to make matters worse, we have a, a development team that runs under these, this concept called agile principles, and then the rest of the business was operating under what is, what's typically called waterfall uh, type of principles, and most businesses operate as waterfall. So, so what? <laughs> Like businesses deal with this all the time. Why would, why, why don't you just deal with it, right? Why not just do it the same way that everyone else is doing? Um, plus you have all this risk about a growing company. Why add one more set of complexity? And it's because I think social experiments are fun. <laughs> so, and why, why else are you gonna own a company if you can't mess around with people? Um, so, um, <laughs> so, so what I thought about is, okay, what if we fundamentally do two things? Um, number one, we reorient our people and we reorient our processes. Um, so what if, instead of just being hearsay, we actually empower our people and trust our people? Hmm, kind of interesting. If we actually make them accountable and, and they have ownership for some of these things. And what if these, these teams of people that are empowered and enlightened actually had autonomy to do what they need to do? Um, and from a, a, a process perspective, what if you could actually see all of the work that was going on? You know, a lot of people talk about, like, um, you, know, they, you know, we've got this company goal out here, but how do I know that it's actually connected? The thing that I'm doing today is connected to some lofty, you know, add six million dollars of revenue, you know, or whatever it is, the thing that you're going after. Um, and then how do you also build in continuous improvement so that people understand that it's okay to fail and that when you fail, you use that as a learning and you can use that to improve? So um, we changed the paradigm and we moved from this concept of departments to skill pods. We, instead of having handoffs, we started to say, you know what we're gonna do is we're gonna create cross-functional teams. And these cross-functional teams can come together and they have all of the resources that they need to complete that task all the way to completion. So there's no, no more handing off between any departments and I'll get into a little bit more of what that looks like. Instead of projects, which take months, sometimes years, I'm sure some of you guys have been involved in projects that take years, um, what if we focused on shipping something that was a minimum lovable thing that could make someone happy today? Um, and it's <laughs> instead of waiting for months at a time to get this, instead of these large releases, um, we continuously ship stuff. Instead of that quality handoff that's like right at the end and then there's a whole bunch of people saying, is this okay before we throw it over the line? What if we built in automated processes that could, that could give you that feedback all the time? And instead of worrying about projects, what if we started worrying about experience that people had? So this is what it looks like. Um, we simplified the company um, down to two things, is um, you're a customer or you're part of the product team. And the product team is everything. So the product team is your salespeople, 
it's your processes, it's the product that you're actually delivering, again, whether you're manufacturing widgets or whether you're creating software, um, but your customer um, is constantly going to ask about things and they're gonna have an experience with you. And your product, you have a culture that you've built up around your, your company and that this product is everything that you are. So every time a person touches you or touches your company, they have an experience and they know exactly what they're getting. And so I'll go into a little bit more detail of what that looks like. So to, to get that, you need um, release teams. Um, so these release teams are cross-functional. Again, it doesn't go from department to department. What we do is we literally take all of the people that you need to get something done. So these teams literally design or dream it, they design it, and they deliver it all the way through the end. So they start at the very beginning, so they're empowered, they make all these decisions. And so this is a, uh, a concept where we say, okay, maybe we need an engineering person, maybe we need to add an analytics person to this team, uh, we need a salesperson that needs to be involved with this team, and they all come together as a cohesive group. They make all of their decisions by themselves. They can come to their manager and ask for direction if they need direction, but they all come together and they actually take that problem and deliver it all the way through, and then they disperse, they go back to their skill pod, and then they can rejoin another team uh, after that. <coughs> so what's a minimum lovable product? <laughs> it's the bottom one. Um, it's not the top one. So it's actually, if you use, and we're gonna get, I'm gonna get into this about the separation between work and planning, um, but it is actually exceptionally difficult to force people to start to th fundamentally think about the thing that they're doing today has to be lovable tomorrow. And whatever they're putting together, they're putting it in someone's hand so that they have happiness all the way through. So again, if you're creating one wheel and you deliver that, it doesn't make sense to anyone, right? But if you create the skateboard and then you do this other thing, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty good analogy for for how these teams need to come together and start to think about the way that they do their work. So the way that it works is we created what we call a domain model. And this domain model is a, uh, a really important concept um, of how you organize your people to do this. So at the portfolio level, um, that is all of the executive leadership as well as the board of directors. So every time I go into a board meeting, um, my investors say, you need to do X, Y, and Z. And how do I translate that back to the company, right? I need, I need a way to do that. On the, on the flip side, I've got engineers who are working on a piece of software or working on something, and they're going, uh, this widget is squeaky over here, and if you don't fix it, the whole system's gonna break, right? And how, it, how do I know that that thing that's squeaking is any less important than the thing that my board of directors is asking for, right? And so we needed a way that information could flow both up and down. So starting with the portfolio level, um, we have uh, company level goals that we, we look at and we set. Um, coming down to the next level is what we call the program, and this is really kind of mission control uh, overall. And this group meets daily. It's a small cross-functional management team that comes together, and they, they focus on objectives and key results. So they negotiate and they outline frameworks um, that the group of people um, will come together and actually work around. And then the release teams are the actual people that do the work, and they're working on user stories and tasks that are connected to those objectives. Obviously, those objectives are tied to company goals. So it seems kind of straightforward, but this kind of mental framework is actually really, really uh, important for people. And the thing that I, would, uh, that I really want to point out here is that work is different than planning which again, on the surface, sounds very you know, straightforward. But what we found is before, under prior, and this happened at other companies, you sometimes have task level things that are competing with, uh, with objectives, or you have or some sort of strategic goal that people are making. So the point is, is that by creating a single language that everyone says this is not a project or this is not a task, and they actually have an understanding of what that definition is, um, we were able to start to organize and prioritize our work um, and start to create teams around this to make things much more efficient. So an objective uh, is actually just a work container, okay? And what happens there is they can't be assigned as work, it's because it's actually the outcome of everything that you end up doing, right? And that's why it gets managed at the, at the program level. And it's also the thing that gets prioritized. So you don't have a task that is prioritized over an objective. All of those tasks need to roll up into, into those objectives. Um, and then the teams are organized at that objective level and they, the release teams come together around that. Now from there, once those teams come together, they get what are called key results. 
So they are individually assigned people um, on those teams that are, are responsible and accountable for delivering specific key results to meet that objective. And then they work together to create user stories and task level things that they do every single day. And they get to prioritize the work all underneath them. So how are they going to get to that key result? How are they going to create that minimum lovable thing? So once they've done that, they can then start to plan their work. And again, planning in this context is different. So like if you think about a typical waterfall plan and you've got, say it's a three month project, it doesn't matter, some, a lot of times it doesn't matter what order you're doing certain things in. But when you're trying to ship something every two weeks, it does matter, the order, because everything has to be usable at the end of that two weeks. So it really forces these teams to think through how are they going to release that. So I spent a little bit of time here, but it's really important. So the, um, uh, the next thing is this all gets managed through um, having made the work visible. Um, and it's done through, um, we use boards, we, um, they're called Kanban boards. It's just a just a way to manage work and you can actually see these little cards. But what's really neat about it is that at the portfolio level, that, that furthest left one, you see everything is, is um, I think we had six, six or seven different uh, uh, goals for the company. They're all color coded. And what's neat is when you start to go down to the program level and all the way down here to the team level and you can see the teams get a little creative with some of the pictures of cats and Ron Burgundy blowing on a, a shell and you know everything else, but they, they, they literally know that those tasks and those stories, they can click and they can go all the way back up to the OKR board and say, oh, this thing is tied to my sales goal for the year, or this thing is tied to this other growth objective um, that the company is actually working towards. And that's really amazing because in no other organization do you know literally the thing I'm working on today has to do with this at the end of the year. Um, at the program level, again, it's mission control. Um, this is that top down and bottom up, and this team meets every single day. Um, they get something, this is actually something that we stole from the military, but it's, uh, uh, it's called receipt of objective. And so one of the things that the military did um, when they started fighting Al-Qaeda and, and other things is they realized they couldn't have these like large armies with these big plans. They actually needed to meet every single day and reform their strategy on a daily basis. So the receipt of objective means, hey, something else has come in. We need to figure out how we're going to manage this objective overall, or do we need to shift other things around? And the other thing that we, we took from the military is this concept of, they call it battle rhythm, we call it operational rhythm. And every single day we have a different um, uh, uh, thing, people that come in to make sure that all of the areas of the company are being touched around sales and marketing and uh, uh, customer operations, things like that. So there's a rhythm to everything that gets done. And the release teams, they actually request the resources, estimate the effort, prioritize the work, uh, and they meet daily um, and estimate points. And so I'm gonna get a little bit into this point system of how they, how they end up doing that. Um, and it's done on the Fibonacci sequence because that was the most obvious. Um, that came from our developers. I, that was really news to me. But, um, <laughs> so, um, but I want to give you some example of teams. So all of this kind of sounds a little esoteric. I'm going to make this very real. So um, this top one is literally something that we just did um, th this last two weeks. We just released it on Friday. Um, we just launched a new product um, a few weeks ago, and a really funny thing happened. And so, for those uh, investors that are in the room, you'll be, you guys will be excited to hear this. But um, so today, in our current business, we sell these enterprise contracts, which are these multi-million-dollar contracts, and it takes an exceptionally long time, and it's like an act of Congress to get anything approved to get someone to write a million-dollar check. In this new product that we have, we were literally going in, and I have people saying to me in the meeting, "How do I sign up?" And that was a problem I never encountered for <laughs> encounter because normally it takes like a long time. And so I was like, well, uh, let me grab your name and number and you know, I'll let you know. So we realized that we need to have an online sign up that we could instantly take advantage of that and have people sign up for the product. So I came back two weeks ago and I stood in front of the program group and I said, we need an online sign up form. It is the number one priority if we're gonna show traction on this new platform. So I called out the need, the new feature was built and delivered. Um, here's an example of a sales um, uh, release team. Again, totally different type of group. Horizon Blue Cross uh, at, in New Jersey, a four million member plan, massive health plan. They came to us and they said, oh, um, we want you to come and present to us. We're going to give you um, three years of our data and you need to be here in a week to present 
the consumption of that data, the release of how many episodes, it was like three or four episodes, you need to put all this dashboard reporting together and you need to show up here and present it all to us. In any other company, how would you get that done? <laughs> it would be mass chaos. But all we did is we said, here's the receipt of objective, this is a sales opportunity, and um, as it turns out, we're winning Horizon as a result of it. One week, we were able to turn that around. And what we did is we brought in, in this case, engineering. We needed an analytics person. We needed a sales person. We needed a strategy person. And we needed our community manager all to be involved in that process. And they stopped everything else they were doing. Well, not everything, but close to everything. Came together, delivered that entire product so that we could get in front of them. And if you've ever been to uh, Newark, I highly suggest staying away. It is a terrifying, <laughs> it is a terrifying city. Um, so, um, and then the last one was the strategic one. So here's a strategic item, CMS, um, uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, came out a uh, month and a half ago and created a new bundled pa payment mandate called CCJR. They literally made it up. It's gonna be a mandatory type of bundled payment, it just kind of happened. And we said, okay, well, we need to respond to this. We're a bundled payment company. We should probably respond to this. There's going to be 800,000 joint replacements per year that are going to be under this new mandate. We should probably figure it out. So we brought a solutions person together, again, an analytics person, a marketing person, so we could start to pull marketing. We uh, brought a product manager together so we could figure out how to repackage our product. So again, these teams are not just software related. These are strategic. This is sales related. This is, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to do. So here's the results. I'm actually doing good on time, too. Um, it works. <laughs> so we're a very data-driven company. So when we first started this, um, we got 70 points done, <laughs> which wasn't a lot. Uh, and we can get into the point system a little. It's an arbitrary unit of measure, but once you start people using points, you start to get these kind of relative weights for, for using points. Um, by sprint four, 200. By sprint six, we were doing um, almost 600 um, and by sprint seven. And so in 3.5 months, we were able to get that much more productivity out of people. And it's not just because we got better at estimating, it's because the team started to actually work together to get stuff done faster. And then I pulled, I asked them to pull a number last night. We just got done with sprint 13. Same number of people, we're at almost 1300 points every two weeks. I mean, it, the, the, it's just exponential, the way that this continues to rise up. I mean, if I actually had that on the graph, it would you know, dwarf everything else here. I mean, it, it actually works. It, I mean, it's really amazing. I'm, for an experiment, it's been going pretty well. Um, so the other thing that you start to get, too, is some really kind of interesting things. I don't know if this one has a laser on it. It doesn't. But um, So if you look at the orange, so this is an example of an actual release team. So this is at the team level. So you'll notice when this first team, when they came together, they got 21 points done. In the next sprint, they got 29 points. And in the next one, they got 13. So they got up to, uh, um, or in 13, they got 35 points. So what's interesting is as the teams come together, they all start to become more cohesive and they start to become more efficient just as a group that's working together. The other thing that's interesting, if you look at the blue line, when they first came together, they estimated that they would get 43 points done. And they estimated 45 the next time they got even more aggressive. But if you look at that last one, they estimated 35. So they actually learn how to work together over time as well. And they understand how much we're actually going to get done together as a group. And that's a really amazing outcome. One of the other really neat things is um, these are all of the different release teams that we have on the right-hand side. Those are all the release teams that we're currently running. Um, Something kind of interesting happened um, is you get a really interesting view into resource allocation. So um, we had this dashboard product and someone robbed Peter to pay Paul and no one got anything done <laughs> because all those other resources got out. And so one of the things that it helped us realize is we ended up coming up with what we call a work in progress limit. So there's only so many things that you can get done and have resources for. And so we were able to expose that you know, very, very quickly. So the results is um, it stopped shadow work. And what we call shadow work is it was amazing when we started this process. All of the things that people were working on that you have no freaking idea why people are working on it. <laughs> like they think that they're doing the right thing. Like they think that they're helping, but like what they're doing has nothing to do with what you're trying to do as a company. 
And so the first thing we're like, why are you doing that? Like, who told you to do that? They're like, I just thought it'd be helpful. <laughs> you know, most people don't come to work and say, I'm gonna really screw up today. Um, I think, you know, most people, you know, want to, you know, come to work and, and do the right thing. So the other thing, it gave us immediate visibility and the individuals understood immediately the value of their work. So I'm doing this thing, it's tied to this company goal. And it's not BS, you know, like they really know that what they're doing. The other thing that it has helped us to do is that we've failed faster. We learn faster, right? Like, as you could see, like even in that estimation, right? People got better at estimating and, and how they're actually gonna work together. Higher quality work, better client satisfaction. Um, the, um, one of the interesting things is this concept of a retrospective. So every two weeks when they're done, they are forced as part of a retrospective activity to look back at their last two weeks and say, what did we do well and what did we really suck at? And what are we going to do better to get better this next time? And so they're forced to actually look at the work that they're doing to get better. Um, and the other really interesting thing is it's helped us attract high quality employees. So we've been able to attract people from Amazon, from Google, from uh, we've moved people from uh, New York and Silicon Valley and, and Seattle, Washington. We've been able to move all these people here because they come and they realize that high performance Right? They want to be part of a high performance team. And that's the standard. And it's part of the culture of getting better. Right? Culture isn't just this squishy thing. It's about constantly delivering results. Um, and as a result, it's become a competitive differentiator for us. Um, we, uh, we've been going through a fundraise process. And we had an independent group come in and, and uh, look at us. And we said, oh, yeah, we're an agile company. And they said, yeah, right. And, and um, there's like most people you know, say that. And we're like, well, no. And we're actually doing it across the whole company. And they're like, we've never heard or seen anyone do this. And this was a group out of Silicon Valley. And they gave us the report back after. They're like, we can't believe it. This is, this is amazing. Um, so our learnings from this, though, is that this is not for the faint of heart <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, you have to prepare for some quitting. <laughs> There's going to be some quitting. And that's exactly what happened uh, when we did this. Um, it wasn't a mass exodus. Um, there was a lot of people who threatened to quit. And they didn't actually end up quitting. And then they had, ended up getting comfortable, especially project managers. Project managers are, were like the worst. Um, they're like, there's no way that this can work. Um, but it works. Um, What's really important is this consistent language and understanding of terms. So when we first launched this, and when you're looking at the 70 points and some of those other ones that were a little earlier on, we didn't have the domain model in place, um, as strange as that sounds. And like we didn't have a common language. It so sounds so like arbitrary, right? But you literally need people to say the same words and mean the same thing when they say it. And then all of a sudden, things can start clicking. Um, so when we had that, um, that, that really helped us out. Um, having that model framework. Um, We've learned that this just isn't for software companies. The other thing that we learned is you have to go low tech. Um, so we spent an inordinate amount of time because we're technology geeks, you know, trying to figure out tooling. You know, what, what cool tool can we use in the cloud that can help us manage all of this? And like everyone was trying these different things. And finally I was like, okay, we're stopping this. The goal of this is to get people to talk and meet together every single day. So you're not using any tools at all. You're going to write this down on paper. And so I got sticky notes out. And everyone organized their work through sticky notes to start. Um, and then after that, we moved to a Trello board, which was a little bit more high tech. And then the other thing that we've learned is semi-permanence. So the concept of semi-permanence is I, I went a little too far in the initial iteration of this where um, we were changing out the teams too, too often because I say, oh, I want that resource and I want to move this over to this other release team. What we found is that someone needs to maintain some level of tribal knowledge. Um, and consistency to cohere a group together. You can't just wipe out a whole team and then put a new one in and hope that they're consistent. So teams learn together. So obvious, pretty obvious, but at first we made that mistake. Um, and then Todd was actually supposed to be here um, with me today. He's at home putting out a fire, um, not literally, well, in the office, um, putting out you know, things that we've got going on. Um, but um, if you have like a steel gut, and you really want to try this, I promise you it'll work. Um, and this is how you implement it. So one is you got to just commit. And you just don't look back. And just say, that other process, it's never going to be an option. It's just not an option. And we're going to figure this out. Because the first three months are really rocky. Everyone was like saying that we were crazy. Um, you need to find a Todd. So that's Todd. 
You need to find someone like Todd. And because if you, when it really comes down to it, this is a people problem, right? This is, pe this is how people get things done. And you need a change agent and someone who's also a good servant leader, someone who isn't just gonna bang on people to get things done, but really kind of build consensus around the group, listen to everyone complain, say it's gonna be okay, you know? We're gonna go on this journey together, you know? We're gonna get through this. So you need to find a Todd. Um, you can tell, very soft, very soft guy, great guy. Um, and, uh, and then you need to train your executives, you need to train your managers and your leaders, and then you can roll it out to your group. And that's, that's exactly the order um, that we did it in. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty cool, um, pretty cool little framework. Again, right on time, uh, 8.30, so I don't think we're gonna do, that was good. <laughs> it's moving, I got the thumbs up, so that's great. So um, qu question, no, no questions? No questions, so I think we've got a couple of minutes if anyone has questions. So thank you for having me. Yes? How many employees do you have, and do you, do you find a challenge to recruit the people for, to work in your environment? Um, so in the current company, I have uh, 55 today. Um, in a previous life, I had 3,000. In a previous life, it was like 150. Um, so I've kind of had groups of, of different sizes. Um, as far as recruiting, it's actually become a recruiting tool for us. Because um, what we do is we invite them, uh, a candidate in for a day, uh, and we do a lot of flying people in um, to convince them to move and things like that. And they walk out, and one of the things is you can't hide, right? Like if you just interview with one person, like it's really easy to like, you know, put on a happy face and this company's great, come work here. But like when you interact with like 20 people in a day, like you're gonna get a sense of what the company's like. And so what we found is people walk out and they're begging for a job. We don't even have to really negotiate salaries at that point because they're just so excited to be a part of a team and how excited everyone is to, to be a part of something. Yes, that's actually something we've been tackling recently. Um, it's a, um, it changes when you do this because one of the things that this does is it flattens an organization um, quite a bit. Um, there's uh, way less hierarchy overall. Um, there are pillars of hierarchy, but um, that's kind of a more advanced topic. But the, the, um, um, the, we've developed something that we call flow. And it was in response to needing a new way to, and so flow stands for feedback loop to optimize work. <laughs> so in the same way that we have automated feedback loops for all of the stuff that we do for customers, we've built the same mechanism for employees. Um, and uh, it's a four quadrant thing. Um, uh, the the uh, manager only gets five words to say something. Um, and so what it does is it forces people to be direct. Um, one of the problems with the Midwest is um, everyone's so nice. <laughs> and like sometimes you just need to be like asshole, um, like very effective, you know, like whatever it is, like you just need to say what you need to say, you know, and then just like, you know, then there's no like in room for interpretation, like what do they really mean, you know? <laughs> uh, so, um, so anyway, so it, it allows a way to develop the employee that way to become more effective. They also get five words back to the manager. So that's always fun too, right, as a manager, uh, to, to be getting those five words back. Um, but uh, it allows for that. And then on the, um, the growth, it has to do with these pillars um, that we have set up. And then there's uh, leadership opportunities within each of these groups to lead these teams and um, you know, do things like that. And then also become skill pod leaders as well. Um, so the skill pod, so like if you're a group of developers, they need to continue to refine their skills and they have separate offsites and you know, m management and things that they do as well. all traditional mindset, yep. And we had brought them in, you know, thinking that they wanted to work for an innovative company. And sometimes people don't understand that means like, tomorrow I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna change everything. And, um, <laughs> and you're gonna have to like deal with it. Um, so, you know, uh, it sounds really cool until like you have your cheese moved. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I've, I've, I have the same thought. Um, so I'd, I'd answer that two ways. Um, my hope is yes. So again, remember this is a giant experiment. Um, 
it could completely break down and it could be the effective thing for right now. Um, I think um, our hope is that it could, it, it could scale us to, I would say three, 500, maybe even 1,000 people if, if we got there. Um, but again, it could completely break down, so I don't, I don't know. But my hope is that it would. Uh, I would love, uh, I, I, I don't know if I'd ever want to go work for a big company again, but if I did, it'd be really fun to try this um, there and see what happens. <laughs> 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 if anyone wants to let me come and experiment on your company, <laughs> please, like, I'll do a pro bono, like, just let me come in. <laughs> I'll move some cheese around. Yep, go ahead. <laughs> Um, as, oh, you mean uh, for the company itself? Yeah, so um, we relocated the company to Columbus, Ohio um, a year or 18 months ago. Um, so it's a great city, um, 15th largest in the country, uh, 2 million people there, um, great talent pool, still Midwestern, so it allowed us to kind of cheap cost of living, so it allowed us to, to kind of keep the values that we wanted um, and then not have to go to a Chicago or go to a Denver or an Austin or something like that, so to still kind of have, you know. So, there's, um, so uh, there is a group of investors out of Silicon Valley um, who ended up investing in us in the last round. They have a fund there. Um, they had an ecosystem and a kind of a support network set up. They didn't demand that we move there, um, but we looked at it you know, compared to some of the other cities and we thought you know, it would be a pretty good, pretty good place to live. Yeah. Oh, yep. Could I just follow on that a minute? Yeah. Well, it's a, so uh, it's a good question. So there's actually a great example of another company here. So Craig Dickman at, at Breakthrough, I think his is a great example of a super innovative company um, who has you know, continued to grow the base of the company here. Um, I would say two things. I think one, um, uh, and actually we talked about this over dinner, um, I think that um, the business environment here through um, like the economic development stuff um, is a little bit weaker than, um, than what it is, um, than what we have um, uh, in Columbus, Ohio. It's a very business centric, very, um, you know, kind of driven, uh, driven in that way. Um, so that, that lacks a bit here in Northeast Wisconsin. Um, in all honesty, um, and I know I'm going to get ribbed from Al uh, after this meeting. I know, I know, I, mean, I know, I know it's going to happen. I think if I could do it all over again, I'm not, I know, I don't know if I would move the company again. I think there are aspects of it that, um, you know, you make the best decision at the time and place that you can do it. I do think that sourcing the developer talent and the analytics talent is just a, a problem in general around here because there's a lot more kind of like skilled labor workers than there are knowledge workers. Um, but I think um, through St. Norbert, we actually have, we've hired some great people from St. Norbert, um, we've hired some great people from GB. Um, I think that if we could widen that net to say, if you could pull from uh, Madison and from Milwaukee and some of those things, I think that it, I think it is possible uh, to do it. Um, so yeah, if you had asked me that six months ago, I would have said, absolutely, best decision. Nah, I don't, I don't think we could have still done it here. I think we could have still done it. Sorry. Because <laughs> Al was like, why are you doing this? You don't have to do this. <laughs> so you were right. You were right. <laughs> There's one. There's one, yeah, exactly. One more question? No? Um, yeah, well, um, I do have, um, if anyone's interested, if this actually was interesting to you or you think some of the concepts would apply, um, I would be happy to email anyone a copy of the presentation afterwards um, if you're interested. So just come grab a card or, or whatever. But I really do appreciate the opportunity to come speak to everyone today and uh, hope you have all great 9 o'clock meetings this morning. Oh, yeah, Al. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Al. <laughs> Great. Thank you.
Kurt, thank you. That was a terrific presentation and uh, exactly what we want in this series, which is you know really a lot of insight into the strategy of your company. And uh, you can always come back. Yeah, thank you. We really do want to thank uh, Kurt for being here. We want to thank all of you for coming this morning. If you would like a DVD of today's presentation, please see Amy Sorensen. Amy's back here with her arm raised. We'd be happy to provide that. Also, we want to invite you to our next CEO breakfast where Dan Ahrens of the Ahrens Company will be speaking on the art of leadership balance. That's going to be February 2nd. So we're going on past the holidays. February 2nd at Butamore Country Club down in Appleton. So we look forward to seeing you there. And uh, meantime, enjoy your fall and the holiday season and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>